What's up, everybody? Today on Make It Cozy, we're going to take this kitchen, brighten it up into this kitchen. It's going to be a long one, so strap yourselves in, folks. All right, here we go. All right, so to get to where we are right now, took a lot of planning, took a lot of effort. So I want to just hit some high notes to give you a big picture look at what we're doing for this video and also to tell you how I maintain budget. So whenever we moved into this place, the you saw it probably from previous videos of mine where I'm doing cooking or doing the shabori napkin thing, but it was really dark. And the first thing that we did whenever we moved in, even before all the other stuff, was we painted the walls. We got it a nice like light bluish gray color just to brighten it up, and that did wonders. But the first thing that we knew that we had to accomplish in order to make this whole kitchen work for the revamp was getting the hood because there was like an over the range microwave that all I did was just recirc the air back in. And the grease traps that were there, they were super tiny. They were inefficient in my opinion. And they got these over the, over the range frame, super greasy. And part of, the, part of the drop down too, really gross. I don't like that. I didn't have a hood growing up as a kid. I mean, I was like, you know, living in the hood basically, but you know what, hey, hood in the kitchen, I never had it. All right, so check this out. The folks who had this before, I don't know how they went from having outside exhaust to going to inside exhaust, but I'm gonna show you the outside bit. Tell you what I'm working with on that. If you look right here too, right? It's a little busted up, but you can tell, boom. Hood spout. Hood exhaust, I should say. So for the hood, there was a couple things that I wanted to have happen for that, actually three things. One was the sound level. Sound level had to be maintained low because I didn't want it to sound like a jet engine going off whenever I'm cooking. Right, all I want you to hear is a nice sizzle of, of meat on cast iron or whatever I'm cooking, you know, it doesn't matter. And there's a couple things that you need to research about that. One of them, you might see decibels, you might see sounds levels. But as long as it maintains what you're comfortable with, do your research, it does a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good to do a little research in the, in the forefront. The next thing though, is that it had to be easily clean, but it had to be able to push out a lot of exhaust as well, right? So, so these traps, are super huge compared to like, like the ones that were over the range were probably like a quarter of this. And I'm not having that, right? These are large. It also has two speeds. The low speed, I can barely hear it whenever I'm cooking. I probably hear the sizzle more than I do the exhaust, which is nice. And for like, you know, stuff that's not really pushing out a lot of grease or whatever, and I don't really like deep fry or whatever, but if I was, I'd use the high level. And the high level, if you're sizzling anyways, you're not gonna, it's, you're not gonna hear it. You know what I mean? Like it's just gonna drown each other out, so it's cool. So this one, real nice, had to happen, right? The other thing is like, yo, if we can maintain the grease and we can maintain a cleaner kitchen, we had to replace the backsplash for sure because I hate those little finger joint things. It looks good aesthetically in somebody else's house, not mine. Terrible to clean. We also had to check out what we were gonna do about the cabinets. I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're trying to do this for less than three grand and replace all of your cabinets, not gonna happen. Unless you got like Uncle Bo who's gonna be like, yo, I'm gonna hook you up with my cabinets for your charge, pro bono. We found a company that you give them a bunch of the legwork, right? Measurements, how many drawer, how many doors, and you send them the specs, they send you the stuff. Pre-cut, already ready to install, right? So we sent that off, we said, yo, give us a quote, we'll let you know, and they said, okay. Luckily, they were running a promotion, and we got these things 20% off, the whole kitchen, all the cabinet doors and all the drawer fronts. With that though, we had to keep the frames. We wanted a color match. So I asked him for a swatch, swath, paint swath, swatch, swatch, whatever it's called. I asked him for a color card, took it to the hardware store and said, hey, can you color match this? They put it in the robot and went, Brr. yes, we can. And they said, cool. So we got the little baby. Don't buy the big one. Test it with the baby first. We tested it on the island, right? We did a little spot. We put the card, the paint card next to it from the sample store or from the sample folks that got us these. And it was pretty spot on. And I mean, you can see, right? It looks very well color matched, in my opinion. If you're here in person, even better. So we sent that off and we said, yo, let's go ahead and do this. We all, all we gotta do, backsplash, paint, cabinets, and lighting. We had to redo the lighting that was under, under the cabinet lighting here and over the sink. Cause we had like this like outdated, like wavy partition thing or cover, I don't know. We, we just bust that, psh, take it clean out. Replaced it because we had like a drop light too. We had drop lights which were two bulbs, which is not a big deal, but it just like hits like right above the sink and I don't like that too much. This guy right here was like a halogen lamp and you know what? I'd rather go LED for both because you can maintain your, your LED colors 
as far as what you're doing with your overhead light to maintain what I want is a bright kitchen, maintain the bright kitchen. We're gonna go through piece by piece once we took out the over the range microwave and took out the support plate that went on the back. We knew like, hey, I actually like the tile that they had chilling right here in the front part. Other thing too is that I'm not really going to into big detail about my knife block, except to say that I prefer a magnetic mount on the wall. I think the most useless, useless thing that's taking up real estate in your kitchen is probably a knife block. You might as well throw it in the burn bin whenever you're going outside for like a summer cookout or whatever, because all it's doing is taking up counter space and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything but hold your knives. You can either make yourself a Saya to put all your knives in the drawers and segregate them from all your other stuff so they don't bang around into your blades or put them on the magnetic mount. I'd rather have real estate on my kitchen for my Shibori napkins than a knife block. But that's just my opinion. If you like them, hey, it's all you. That's your opinion. But let's go ahead and get into this demolition right now. We're starting to come out of demolition mode. So, right, you saw what I did was that I took out all the tile that was previously here. I did not like it. All right, I did not like the tile at all. We want to brighten this kitchen up, right? I love to cook. I love cooking, making food, making whatever, experimenting with food and sharing it too, right? So I want to have a really nice, bright, lively kitchen, right? We got the hood installed, that's great, but eventually we want to get new appliances too. That way we can get like stainless steel or something just to brighten the kitchen up because I don't want a dark kitchen. It should be, it should be comfortable. It should be cozy, right? Let's make it cozy, dude. Seriously, that's what this whole channel is about. Demolition done. I went ahead and removed all those tiles and I went through with a four inch scraper to try to just bust out some of that thin set or mastic or whatever it was because there's all those high spots whenever they're laying the tile right. I want to make sure that it's completely smooth. That way, whenever I go to lay the tile, a lot of the imperfections are going to be bubbling up. Some folks might want to, you know, knock out everything here and redo the sheetrock. That's cool. That's up to you. I don't like laying drywall. What I do want to do is just make sure that all this stuff is level. So I laid out some of this butcher paper. I got the one and done, right? You buy like 7 million feet and you're good for the whole year. I went ahead and laid some strips down right here on the kitchen just to kind of protect the countertops from all the chips and stuff that were coming out. That way I went through with the, hey, whoa, Miles Dyson guys. She's gonna blow them away. Anyways, a little movie reference for you. So I'm gonna go through, right? And scrape all this down to make sure that I get all the high points out. I'm going through and I just went ahead and checked that out the whole way through. We did have some casualties, unfortunately, because Stay level, level, damn. Right, you can see over here, they don't wanna listen, man, they don't wanna listen. But anyways, punched the hole next to the outlet. It wasn't reinforced in the back, there was no stud, at least not on that side. And so, gonna have to go through and patch with the 45, the 45 minute mud. All right, that's gonna be the next step. What do you think? It's good. Okay. Okay, you wanna do some more? Okay. Get it nice and smooth. Oh, good. Done. Perfect, thanks. Boom, this is what I'm going with for this. Right? I think it's gonna look real nice against, uh, once we go and get stainless steel appliances, plus with the pop of color coming from the cabinets that'll be here, be here soon, hopefully. But anyways, like I said, I want to minimize any, any bubblage. So this is drastic, right? But I don't want to, I want to minimize anything that looks like this. This is just my attempt to show that, hey, demolition's easy, but you got to take your time whenever you're starting to put stuff together. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. It just takes a little bit of planning. Speaking of planning, I left this board right here behind the stove that was used as the, uh, as the marks for laying the previous tile that was already installed. I may move that, I might not. But what I do want to do as far as the planning goes for the next step is to minimize, minimize any kind of cuts that I got to do to this tile. I want to minimize my time, downtime cutting and minimize any kind of slivers. So what I'm talking about up there is like, I don't want like a tiny sliver here. I don't want a tiny sliver up here. I don't want tiny slivers up by the hood. I don't want them by the sink, right? So if I got to go through and cut the tile right here to where I'm working with maybe an inch or so on both ends, so be it. 
what I don't want to do is cut a little like half inch, quarter inch piece of tile just to fix that little, you know, spot where I need an eighth on either side of the backsplash. So let me show you what I'm talking about, right? If I lay this right here, and I'm just gonna lay it flat. I know you're supposed to have like an eighth inch gap or whatever, but let's say I lay this here, all right? Now this looks nice right here. I can put a little tile strip and boom, just land it right there, right? Land the strip. But that may be different if I'm doing it right here. So it could, it looks like it's gonna be pretty nice, but I wanna try to do like a dry fit, so to speak. You talk about measure twice, cut once. You gotta check out this backsplash at least twice, get your opinion from, you know, your partner or whatever, make sure that they're comfortable with it as well. And then just go up. So if I have a little, a little spot right here, it looks like it's gonna be all right for under the hood. But I wanna take that around all the way to make sure that it's gonna be consistent and it's gonna be nice and it doesn't look like an amateur did it, you know what I'm talking about? All right, it's a new day. It's a beautiful day, everybody's mowing their yards and I'm in here in the kitchen. However, we do have these guys nice and clean. We painted them. Uh, we just used some, you know, industrial poison to get all that grease out. Scraped it. We had to scrape wherever it was because like right above where the hood was supposed to be, nasty, right? You can see I'm gonna have to patch this up right here because the grease is taking the paint literally off of the walls. So we're gonna have to get that later on. So what I got going on right now, right? You saw me and my kiddo, we were painting the faces of the cabinets and that's all done. We put on two coats and we just use the satin. We just use the satin, like not the like bottom shelf stuff, but we didn't use like the top of the line either. We just got to get interior exterior paint. And I didn't go cabinet grade either. You can go cabinet grade if you want to, but I'm not painting my cabinet doors where I'm going to get a lot of like splatter and stuff like that. Just doing the faces. <clears throat> I just went with the middle shelf stuff. And <laughs> I bought a gallon, but I didn't even get anywhere close to using the full thing. I think maybe if you were doing even the doors and drawers that maybe you would go through a gallon of paint, but you could probably get away with a quart. Like you can see the size of my kitchen throughout this video, right? And maybe a quart would have been sufficient if they, if your local place sells quart size. So as far as like patching all the mud and stuff like that, right? I got the real troublesome spots like that by the outlet that, you know, some of the places that blew out the, the drywall. But it's some of the other things that, you know, I was looking and getting tips and tricks from tradespeople is like, if you go through and just check out the wall itself, right? Like right here, I got a high spot. It teeters. And I'd be willing to bet that like that's the part right there that maybe some of the drywall is like buttoned up against each other and they just laid like a little extra bit of mud. And hey, if you're doing, you know, the finger joints or whatever, maybe you can get away with, you know, not having it smooth like that, but I want to make sure that it's smooth. So I got my brick, boop, and I just went through and just checked different levels or use my level to check different spots on the wall. And I use this one to get into hard to reach places. I got a, just a piece of ply that's flat on the factory edge. So I use that one to get into some spots. And then the, the big the big level that you saw me dropping earlier or whatever, I went through and just checked. And probably, if you're looking at like a gap of maybe like a 16th of an inch, uh, that's probably like where you wanna call it because I had some spots that were like really bad. Uh, right here behind the stove was one of them and then the other one was behind the sink. That sink was terrible. It was like, if I'm the, pretend I'm the sink, right? I'm like the kitchen sink, everything but the kitchen sink. But the walls right here, right? They're all flat. They're pretty good. And then it was like bad like this. And then even the section right by the light that's over here, it was off like this. Like they didn't even butt up the drywall completely. It was terrible. It was like off on an angle. So I had to mud and then mud and then mud and make sure that was flat. So that, you know, it was going to look good. I didn't want it to like, you know, lean back like fat Joe or whatever. I wanted to be smooth, man. I wanted to be smooth, smooth operator. You know what I'm saying? This is a smooth operation. So I'm going to get all these high spots off, right? I marked the high spots. I got one right here. The one you saw me messing with earlier. So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna brick it out. Shh. I'm gonna get my commando mask, boom. So I can go commando on this. Make sure I'm not breathing in any dust. So that's what's coming next, is to level out this wall. But speaking of that, right, laying tile, the little story stick or whatever it's called back behind the thing, behind the stove, I'm gonna have to raise that up because now that I have, you know, we're in like the landing zone or whatever now, or the uh, landing strip, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, landing strip. Other thing too is like this one isn't level and and I'm pretty sure the one behind the sink probably isn't gonna be that much better anyways because you're talking about like seven feet worth of that little baby backsplash or whatever it's called. I'd be willing to bet that, you know, you take a 30 seconds of an inch and you extrapolate that seven feet. It's probably gonna be 
terrible, you know what I mean? So I know that like some folks, they might terminate it back behind where the fridge goes. And you can do that, that's cool, because then you can just terminate it and that'll be it. If you got extra tile, by all means, keep that as an option. But I wanna keep it level with the, uh, with the same plane on that side of the cabinets and the back of the countertop as well. So I'm gonna use that shooter dude and that's where it's gonna terminate. Let's go ahead and get that rolling. We're in the home stretch. All right, ready to rock. No more, no more procrastinating. It's time to start masticating. Except with mastic, not chewing. <clears throat> Even though we are in the kitchen, I got the trial ready. I got the good box of goodies. So I cut them all into individuals and I got the pieces that are gonna be going into the, re not the recesses, but the, uh, the extra slots that are gonna go here and here. And then I need a little bit to go around this part here. I got my Schluter ready and the little piece. So I cut that, ready to roll. Ledger board is good. I'm gonna start off with this first row because this is gonna be the uh, easier one in my opinion, only because there's two outlets. So what I did was I cut the power, tested it with my booyah meter, and then I undid the, uh, the outlet right here. So what I did with this is a little tip from Stud Pack that I really enjoyed and want to take as much guesswork out of the situation as I can because I'm not a professional. I only pretend to be. So here was the original outlet covering. And this thing I believe is three and an eighth by five. Yep, three and an eighth by five. So this thing is two and an eighth by four. So that gives me, whoops, let's focus here. Four, two and an eighth. And then this is gonna give me a half inch uh, clearance on both sides. So I went through and I made sure the sand, you know, the spots right here. And this is the plug that I had the blowout right here. But the point of the story is, is that I don't want to have to guess where the tile is whenever I go to put this thing back on. And the half inch overlay is going to be great because I can butt up my cuts to go around this outlet right up against this. I don't have to worry about measuring, chipping, uh, going, around, going back and grinding. Check out the stud pack. They got a lot of good uh, information when it comes to this stuff. So when it comes to this one, it's not so cut and dry, right? So what I did was I made another little block and these are just drywall screws, but whenever the time comes, I'm gonna take this guy off like so. I'm gonna mount this after I take apart all the doodads that are back there. And then that way I can uh, still have that half inch like overlay, so to speak, so that that'll be ready to roll when it's ready to roll. Similar, gonna have to do that there. And I've got my piece ready to go for the schluter for this edge right here. Lots of love. Let's do this. Enough talk, let's do this. So here we go, laying the mastic and tile. And I chose this because it's a premix, which is easy for an amateur like me to use. But also it's not a bathroom floor that would constantly get wet. And so in those kind of cases, you would wanna go with a thin set. But here we go, laying the mastic and the Schluter, and I'm just pushing the tile in and the little spacer pieces that you saw me cut earlier. And I went with the laser level. For a stingy person like me, it was an absolute must to make sure everything looked good. So here we go. Fridge. Anyways, I got the uh, backsplash working, which is, you can see my excited face, which is borderline crazy eyes, but yeah, look at that. Well, it's uh, nighttime and it took me all day. Woo! So from 9.30 to 8, so about 12 hours, eh, 11 hours. I can't do math right now. Don't expect me to do math, but. I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. <sighs> you know what? All right, coming at you with, a, with an update. We got the grouting done. We got the backsplashes all laid out. And grouting is probably 100 times easier than thin set, mastic, whatever you're using for the tile work. It's not my favorite. But next thing is, uh, we, like we said, we got the grout all laid out. My wife and I did it real quick yesterday. So it's all set up 24 hours later. And we have the warm gray to match the caulk, which is coming next. And then match the backsplash as well, right? Cause it's like a grayish, uh, what is it? It's endless ivory, mm, very nice. So I got the warm gray uh, caulk to go with it. That's why I'm gloved up so that I can spread the caulk all over the place. And we're gonna get those seams down where the backsplash meets the countertop. So after I get that done, it's time for whoop, cabinets. Cabinets are in the basement, but it's not a big deal because now the next step is to get these guys joined on with the uh with these bloom bloom hinges these are for half inch overlay come on focus focus on the hinge boing and i got a whole mess of them right so i ordered them online kaboom so you install these like this 
the screw goes inside and immediately my first thought was great they made the hole too big the pilot hole to drill in so i can get a good 90. Whoop, whoop. i said oh no big deal just get these little doodads Boing. and you drive these guys in here that way it takes the guesswork out of trying to line up the hinge specifically like if you're doing it yourself you know what i mean so like even though yeah these are the ones they come with most manufacturers whenever they're doing this professionally will have the little doodad already installed the little marble and it's like a little one-way valve you can kind of see here not like a one-way valve but you see it like it only gets driving driven in that way top down and then you drive the screw in there i got a whole i got a whole mess of the screws i got these ones i'm sure you could use the ones that it came with because these are like flat right you see and then the ones that it came with are made for like the wood itself, right? So probably just gonna stick with these just because, hey, that's what it came with, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna pound these in. I got a couple of hammers. I'm just gonna drive these in, bloop, screw them in, bloop, and then uh, flush it up with this one. So I've already got this one done, right? This is what I kind of did. Yeah, it bubbles up around the surface a little bit and some of the paint chips off. Come on, man, focus faster. What's wrong with you? Focus in. Isn't that the medicine, Focusin? Yeah, my kid takes 17 milligrams of Focusin. So like, uh, yeah, so you drive it in, you pound it, and then you come in here, the screws get driven on. I try to just put the screw in, that's so I could pound the whole thing in at once, all three, you know, so to speak. But uh, it's very difficult to hold it. I guess if you had a vice, you could do it that way, but I feel like that's just an extra step that's not even necessary. Just to give it a little start, I'm gonna use the, the driver. Drive it in. I don't know why I keep talking like Keanu. There we go. That like so, and then you just disrupt the work that you had laid out, and then boom, there you go. So this one's pretty well flush. That one I'm just doing for demonstration purposes, so you know it is what it is. But hey, that way those guys can get installed, and then we'll uh, do 86 more. So the door installation wasn't too bad. Just make sure that you take your time with the appropriate pilot hole so that you're not going to blow out the screw that you're going to be using to install the door itself. And one thing that was very handy with these bloom style hinges is that they have adjustment screws for you to adjust the vertical, the horizontal, and the gap between the, the two doors that, uh, that kind of pair together. And so if one of them looks like it's off on an angle on the vertical or the horizontal, just go by the manufacturer's instructions and check the, the appropriate adjustment screw. So with a little time and patience, I got my doors installed. There's the drop light above the sink that I wanna replace that I talked about earlier. And then with a masonry bit, I got my magnetic knife block installed. Hooray. Doors are on, so the next thing to do is put the handles on, right? So I wanna go ahead and reproduce each individual door. And the way that I'm gonna do that is, with a jig, so let's check it out. So the first thing I did was I stuck this little piece down at the bottom just so I can catch the bottom of the door, right? And then I have these pieces marked on the top and bottom so that I know where to do my piece that's gonna go perpendicular like so, right? So the idea here is to reproduce what came off of the original doors. Now, I just put this on my uh, groutlet piece and the door came one inch from the side three quarters of the way down, and then six quarters of the way for the bottom piece. So as such, like this. Now, I have the one inch drawn right here, and then you don't want to goof this up because I almost did, is that I took three quarters of an inch from right here, or sorry, three and a quarter inch, and then six and a quarter inch. So if you look at this, right, this is six and a quarter, you can see where it intersects. And then I just drilled these two holes out. Now, what I want to do after this is to put this block perpendicular to where this is going to go right so I have some I have it lined up and I went ahead and stuck one of the drawer handles on here just to show you that this is going to be used for both a right side door and the left side door so I can butt it up on the bottom so I can just drill the holes and then I can do that here now if I have a left facing door I could just do it from the other side like this right so now this piece is still, you have to imagine this is still butted up against here, but now I can drill from this side and it's still three and a quarter from the way up right here. And then six and a quarter from the way up here. 
Same thing for my bottom, for the bottom cabinets here, right? So if the doors are gonna be situated where the handle is gonna go right here and right here, as opposed to the top door, which would be here and here, I could just flip it around, do it from the top of the catch of the door, drill, drill, good to go. All right, so just to put the proof to practice, I wanna show you exactly what I was talking about with my handle jig. I'm getting a handle on these jigs. So let's go ahead and check out how this is gonna work, right? So this is a left side and a right side, one size fits all kind of jig, right? So I wanna do the right side, or sorry, I wanna do the left side, so I'm gonna stick it on the right side of where those holes are. So this piece from the side, and up, there's no wiggle, right? It's That's secure, so that's cool. So that way, whenever it's there, I can just and drill my holes out, take it to this side, flip it around, same thing, right there. That way, it's gonna be on the same plane on both sides, and you can kind of see, I stuck, I just stuck this guy through the hole as sort of like a fake punch or whatever. That's why I didn't want to take off this protective film first. That way I can kind of give myself a little extra buffer in case I goof it up. But this guy, I can see the marks right here, right? So it's gonna be approximately right here, which is kind of cool. This side, gonna go right here. That way I have them from both sides, open it up, booyah. So I'm gonna bust these out real quick and we'll get these doors finalized. And then I'll start on my drawers. Drawer fronts, not like my drawers, you know what I mean? All right, so I had to go in with the clamps in order to make sure that my jig didn't rotate or twist as I was drilling. And that way everything is all nice and flush and straight whenever I go to put on these knobs. Because the last thing you want to do is go through all the trouble of, you know, making the jig, getting everything lined up, you're pumped, and then all of a sudden it's skewed. So I did the upper ones and the bottom ones to get them all situated in the same way. All right, so let's talk about these drawer fronts real quick. Got them in place. I got the knobs on there, so that's really nice, or the handles as they're known as. As far as the knobs, that, let's talk about the easy thing first. All I did was I just measured top and bottom, got the center, and then stuck them in the center for each one. It takes a little bit of effort, and like there's really no jig that I can think of, especially because like each drawer face is different uh, measurement-wise, so I was like, you know what? Let's just go center to center and then just stick them in the middle. And that's what I did to get the uh, the handles installed. But as far as the drawer faces themselves, my drawers are outdated. Uh, my kitchen, my kitchen drawers, they're outdated. So whenever I was looking at these things, as far as like my measurements go in the, in the preemptive order, I found a sticker from 1986. And I was like, man, I'm pretty sure like you can tell from, from, the, from the cutaway is that they don't make those slides anymore, right? So I was like, look, I could replace the slides, replace the boxes, but then I'm starting to look at cost, right? The I have seven seven drawers, so if I wanted to replace the slides, you're looking at 14, and they're at least 20 bucks a piece, and that's just for the slides, right? So you want soft clothes? You're looking at way more than 20 bucks. The other thing was, is that depending on who you get your drawers from, you're looking at maybe like 20 bucks a box up to like 100 bucks a box, easy, right? So you're looking at at least like 500 bucks, and that's 500 bucks that I didn't want to spend, so I was like, what could I do? So I'm looking at these dovetails, and the first thing was, for my prototype one, is this one right here. So what I did is that I cut the dovetail here and on the other side, put a new face on it, and then I stuck the drawer front on there. And I just screwed it in from the side, put the handle on, called it good. That worked out pretty well. But then whenever I got this thing off and I started recessing this one back, I was like, you know what? I could probably just use the original wooden drawer face that's on there for the other six and just cut them down and then just use that. And that's what I did for this one and the others right here. So for this one here, this is the original drawer face right here. Still dovetailed, but all I did was just nick it so that it would clear the inside corners right here, right? Because if it doesn't close, it's pointless. And so that's all I did. Problem solved. All right, folks, we're gonna call it right here, but I, I appreciate you sticking with me and I hope that you found some sort of tip, trick, budget-friendly hack, something to make your kitchen cozy. So hopefully we'll see a lot more stuff coming up, either be it cooking, build projects for the kitchen, or something like that. But we'll hit you up on the next one. Peace. Mm -hmm.